Hello! I'm super excited to start this course with you, but as always, before we do, we need to see where we're starting and where we're ending up so we have a clear path to succeeding. So let's see what this course will look like for you. We're first going to start off with creating our hacking lab. Now don't worry whether you're on Windows, Mac or Linux, you're going to be able to follow because what we'll do is use something called a virtual machine to install Kali Linux, which is often used with ethical hacking onto our machine so that we can simulate and create our hacking environment. Don't worry, all the tools we're going to use is free and you're going to be able to set up your computer in a way to follow the rest of the course. And you're also going to have a professional setup. We're also going to cover some basics on hacking, some fundamentals and principles that's going to set us up for success later on in the course. Then we have an optional part. For those that really want to get into programming as well and possibly programming some of our projects later on in the course, we're going to teach you Python from scratch or if you know Python already as a refresher so that you can also learn an extra pair of skill set for some harder projects that we have in the course. Then we get into the fun part. And the first step we're gonna dive into after we have our hacking lab and some of our programming skills sharp is reconnaissance. Here is where we learn what we call footprinting or in other words, information gathering. Once we choose our target, our first task is to gain as much information about the target as possible. We're gonna talk about IP addresses, about the who is tool, the what web stealth scan, finding usernames, building an email scraper tool, and other tools available to us to gather as much information as possible. From there, we go into scanning, and this is where things get real. In this section, we gather information on some of the technical information that we can acquire from a target. For example, if they have open ports, if they have a firewall, what software they're running on these ports, and if they have any outdated operating systems. And don't worry, if you don't know what any of this means, we take you from scratch and you're going to learn it all. Here is where we learn about TCP UDP using the powerful Nmap tool, different types of scans that we can do, how to work with firewalls, using decoys and packet fragmentation. And we're also going to build a port scanner project in this section. From there, we go into vulnerability analysis. In this section, we use the information that we gathered from the previous sections. And with this information, we try to determine whether there is a known vulnerability that we can take advantage of. We're gonna use different sorts of tools to learn about our target.
welcome to the complete ethical hacking course. In this course, we will be covering everything you need to know as an ethical hacker, from theory to the practical examples. We will start with basics first, and the further we go in the course, the more intermediate and advanced stuff we will cover. Knowing theory and practicing different attack methods that we will learn will eventually make you a master in ethical hacking. But wait, wait a sec. We just started the course and I'm already talking about being a master in ethical hacking. Let's slow down a little bit. What even is ethical hacking? And what does an ethical hacker do? Or you might also wonder, can I get in trouble by doing this? Don't worry, remember, we are ethical hackers. This means we are hired to hack into a network or a device, or in general, we want to find as many vulnerabilities inside the target system, but not to do bad things, quite opposite, we want to secure them. An ethical hacker, who is hired to find as many vulnerabilities in a certain system, is also known as a white hat hacker. Now, I mentioned a word system quite a few times by now. What do I mean by finding vulnerabilities in a system? Well, system can be anything. It can be a network of multiple computers, or it could be just one single computer. It could also be some company server that they keep their important data on. We could also be targeting a web page or a website. A vulnerability, on the other hand, is anything that could allow someone to have an unauthorized access to that system. We are there to discover them and secure them. But why are we doing this? Well, as you know, there are the bad guys, or also known as black hat hackers. Their goal is also to find vulnerabilities in a system but not to secure them, instead they want to perform malicious activity once they gain access to that system. That is difference between a white hat hacker and a black hat hacker. A white hat hacker is there to find vulnerability, notify the person that hired him and let him know of a possible unauthorized access. You can think of us as a cyber police, we are there to protect. A black hat hacker on the other hand is there to perform malicious activity such as stealing your data, they could also try to steal your online money, they could install a virus or a keylogger on your PC and track everything that you do, they can go as far as doing something like stealing your identity. However, the methods white hat and black hat hackers use can be quite similar. The difference is we as white hat hackers must make sure that we have a permission to target a certain system. An example would go like this. We get hired by a certain company. That company could have a website, different networks with computers inside the building where for example employees work. It could also have large servers and databases holding important company data. And as we already know, our goal is to make sure that data is secured from cyber attacks. That also employees and their machines are also in a secure network and that website doesn't have any bugs that could present a threat to that company. How do we do all of this? Well, we do it by attacking the company. We act as a black hat hacker would, but with a different goal. Okay, but here we come to another problem. You might be wondering, well, how am I going to learn this? Or how am I going to practice this? I just said that we need a permission to attack any system, right? Well, don't worry, we will simulate all of these targets with the help of our home devices, and also with the help of virtual machines. It will be exactly the same, just this way you won't be breaking any law while you practice since the targets that you will attack will be yours. Ok, more about virtual machines later, right now I want to give you a small challenge. One of the biggest online cyber attacks is something called phishing. In most cases, 
Phishing is an act of black hat hackers tricking you into entering some of your private data, such as usernames and passwords, into a web page that isn't to be trusted. This is one of the ways how they steal online accounts. Let me show you. Here I have two Twitter login pages. One of these two that you can see right here is a fake login page and the other one is real. Let's take a quick look at them. So let's take a look at first one. Here it is. And if we take a look at the second one, they appear to be exactly the same, right? Have you figured out which one is real and which one is fake? The first one that we saw is the fake login page, while the second one right here is real one. Let's mention some of the obvious reasons why this page right here that you're looking at is a fake login page that can be used to steal your account. Even though they are identical at first glance, if we take a closer look, we can see it doesn't really have twitter.com as the website name. Instead, we have some random IP address in our search tab and this is the biggest indication that this page is indeed a fake page and that you shouldn't enter any private information here. The original page should be twitter.com. Another thing we can notice is that next to the website name, on a real page, we have this green lock right here. And this green lock indicates that this is an HTTPS page, or in other words, it is secure, as it says right here, secure connection. Usually phishing websites won't be HTTPS and they won't have this green lock right here. However, these two can be forged in a more advanced phishing attack. And just to compare, our fake login page doesn't have this green lock. If we click right here, it says connection is not secure. And even though many of you probably knew these things already, if you were in a hurry and you got redirected to this fake login page, you could potentially enter your password here and little do you know, in just a few seconds, your account has been compromised and stolen by the bad guys since the information that you enter right here on this page gets sent to them and not to twitter.com. But don't worry if you aren't familiar with these type of attacks. Throughout the course, we will learn not only how to secure ourselves from these attacks and how these attacks work, but also we will learn how to perform the attacks themselves. And by the way, we also have a Discord channel where we answer your questions, so if you haven't already, feel free to come and join us in Discord since that is where we notify everyone about any new course updates that will come out and that is also where you can reach out to us in case you run into any problem during the course. Nonetheless, I welcome you once again, and let's get straight into the course. Okay, so what is a virtual machine? This is something that I mentioned in the previous video, but it is important for us to fully understand what it is. I can just give you a definition and say, virtual machine is a machine within our physical computer that is using its hardware resources. But for most of you, this will be a new term that you haven't really encountered before. So I would like to explain it furthermore for you, as well as mention, why are we going to use it? Let me start like this. All of us are running an operating system and 99.9% .9 of us are running one of the three main operating systems. You either have Windows, Mac OS or Linux. Most of you will have Windows or Mac OS. I doubt anyone will be running Linux, but nonetheless, these are the three main ones. But what if we wanted to run two different operating systems on the same machine? Can we do that? For example, let's say you have Windows installed on your physical machine, but you want to install Linux too. Or even better case, you want to install five operating systems running on different virtual machines. Can you do that? You can. How would that work? Well, picture it like this. Imagine these four lines representing our computer. And we already know that any computer will have one of the three main operating systems. Windows, Mac OS or Linux. But operating system is not the only thing defining our machine. Our machine also has its computer parts. We have 
hard disk, processor, RAM memory, motherboard, and many more computer parts that with the operating system make our machine work. These computer parts are also known as hardware. But wait a second, Alexa. Why are you telling us this? Thought this was a lecture on explaining how virtual machines work, and not on hardware components. Well, hang on for just a second. We're slowly getting there. Picture a virtual machine to be this smaller rectangle within our physical machine, which is this larger rectangle. And let's imagine that our physical machine is running Windows operating system. But if you took a look at this course content, you would probably notice that we're going to be doing all of our hacking stuff over Linux. Does that mean that we must delete our Windows and install Linux? Nope. We will install Linux as a virtual machine. And for this machine to work, it will need to have access to our hardware components. What does this mean? Well, since virtual machine will act as a machine of its own, it must have its own computer parts. And what we will do is we're going to borrow our physical machine's CPU power, RAM memory, hard disk memory to our virtual machine so it can run just like our physical machine. In other words, we're splitting the power of our physical machine into two different machines. Or more, if we decide that we want to create multiple virtual machines. Does that mean that they will be slower since they will be splitting hardware resources? Well, technically, yes, but it will not be noticeable for us, however, the more powerful your PC is, more virtual machines it will be able to run effectively. Another important thing is that once you shut down your virtual machine, all the hardware resources used by it will get freed back for your physical machine to use. Ok, good, but what are other benefits that we have if we create a virtual machine? Well, since we are hackers and we will be doing a lot of things and running a lot of programs on that virtual machine, we want to make sure that we are doing it first in a safe environment, at least while we learn. The good thing about virtual machines is that if, for example, our machine starts getting some annoying error, or we get locked out of our files, or simply we delete a file that we shouldn't have deleted and it crashes our virtual machine. But what if we, for example, get infected by a malware or virus by accident? Or we simply just install the wrong version of operating system, which we don't need. Don't worry, with two clicks we can delete the entire virtual machine with all of its files and it will have no effect on our physical machine. Then we can proceed to create a new one for as many times as we want. We can also create something called a snapshot, which will allow us to save the current state of a virtual machine and with it we can revert it back to that state whenever we want. This could be used if we, for example, run into some errors with our virtual machine. Sounds cool, right? Now that we know how virtual machines work and why are we going to use one, you must be wondering how can we create a virtual machine. Actually, this is pretty easy. All we need are two things. We need an operating system that we want to install in that virtual machine. And we also need something called virtualization software. Now, what is this? Even though it sounds harsh saying virtualization software, what it essentially is, is a program that will allow our physical machine to borrow hardware components to our virtual machine. Or we can also define it as a program that will allow us to run multiple operating systems on a single host or a single machine. So with these two combined, we can create our virtual machine and in the next few lectures we're going to see exactly how to do that. See you there. Before we actually proceed to creating our virtual machine that we will use for hacking, I believe most of you are wondering why Linux? Why are we installing a Linux operating system on a virtual machine? Can't we hack using Windows or Mac OS? Well, yes we can, but Linux is something far better for that. So, what are the benefits of using Linux? First thing that's great about Linux is that it is an open source operating system. This means that we can inspect the code of it and see how it is made and what programs or functions it runs. It can be used for any type of work, not only for hacking, many programmers also use Linux, 
many servers all around the world are running on Linux. And another great thing about it is that most of the Linux distros are free of cost. Maybe some of you have heard about Ubuntu, Linux Mint or Debian. Well, to use an updated Windows operating system, you must pay for a license. Linux, on the other hand, is free to download for anyone. And not only that, but it also, due to it being an open source, it allows the users of Linux to edit, copy or distribute various aspects of Linux-based operating system without violating any copyright law or terms and conditions. This is one of the main reasons hackers use Linux, because they can easily develop softwares used for hacking and penetration testing on Linux, and they can change and edit the operating system for their needs. It is also very light, requires lesser disk space, consumes lesser RAM in order to run, so it can be easily ran alongside any other operating system like Windows and Mac OS. And last but not least is that, as we mentioned, due to Linux being an open source and allowing anyone to change and interact with the operating system, it allows people to create an operating system that will specifically be made for one purpose, such as, for example, ethical hacking or penetration testing. And Linux distros like this already exist. There are Linux distros called Cal Linux, Parrot, Backtrack, and others that are especially made for penetration testing and checking for security loopholes. And all of them are widely being used by hackers. And in this course, we will be using Kali Linux, one of the Linux distros specially created for hackers and penetration testers. What's great about it is that it automatically comes after installation with a bunch of different tools used by penetration testers for hacking. And we're going to cover those tools and go step by step through them. Plus, we'll be installing tools created by other people. And at the advanced parts of this course, we'll be creating our own hacking tools. How cool will that be? So now that we know exactly which Linux distro are we going to install and what are the benefits of using Linux, in the next video, we can create our virtual hacking lab. Welcome back. In the previous few lectures, we talked about what is a virtual machine and what is Kali Linux. We also mentioned virtualization softwares and why we need them. And we also talked about all of the benefits of using Linux. We said that we're going to use Kali Linux since it is a Linux distro especially made for ethical hackers and penetration testers. Now we are finally ready to start creating our hacking lab. So, if you remember, to create a virtual machine, we're going to need two things. Operating system that we want to install and the virtualization software. Let me show you where we can get both of them. So, for the virtualization software, we're going to be using VirtualBox. The thing about VirtualBox is that it is a great virtualization software, very easy to use, and it is also free. Another great thing about it is that it can be ran on any operating system. So whether you have Windows, Mac OS or Linux, you will be able to run VirtualBox. To find it, you simply just type VirtualBox in your search bar and you navigate to this link which says virtualbox.org, click on it and it will lead you to the official page of VirtualBox where you should see this large blue button that says download VirtualBox 6.1. And this 6.1 right here is the current version of VirtualBox, so if at the point of you watching this course there is a newer version available, feel free to download that one, since it will have no difference for the course. Since 6.1 is the current version, I will be clicking Download VirtualBox 6.1, and it will route me to this page where I am able to choose which platform packages I want to install. And these platform packages are split by operating systems. So, if you're running Windows, you will download Windows packages of VirtualBox. If you're on OS X or Linux, you would download one of these two. Since I'm currently running Windows 10 on my machine, I'll be downloading Windows Host's VirtualBox platform packages. So, to download them, just click on them and it will automatically start the downloading of VirtualBox. 
the size of the file is 100 megabytes, but since I already have it downloaded, I will simply just cancel this download, and you wait for this to finish, so you can proceed to download Kali Linux too. To download Kali Linux, we want to navigate to the second page, so just type in Kali Linux in your search bar and navigate to the link that says Kali.org. You should see something like Kali Linux, Penetration Testing and Ethical Hacking Linux. Click on it. And from the official page of Kali Linux, we want to navigate to the downloads and then download Kali Linux. This will lead us to this page where we should see this large table with a bunch of different options and versions of Kali Linux. And in this table we are only interested in two different options. The Kali Linux 64-bit installer or the Kali Linux 32-bit installer. If your machine is a 64-bit machine like mine is, you will be clicking on Kali Linux 64-bit installer. If you have a 32-bit machine, you will be clicking on 32-bit installer. Now, there is another option that you can download it over torrent if you like, but I always download it over HTTP, so I will be clicking this link right here, Kali Linux 64-bit. And this will start downloading my ISO image of Kali Linux, which is our operating system, and you can see right here that the current version is 2020.2, as it says right here as well. And if once again, at the point of you watching this course, there is a newer version available, feel free to download that one instead. Now, since the size of this file is 3.6 GB, it will take some time for it to finish downloading, and since I already have it downloaded on my machine, I will cancel this download as well. For you, just simply wait for both of these files to finish, and then extract them to your desktop, right here. Once you got both of these files ready, now we can proceed to create our virtual machine. Okay, so here we are. We are ready with both of our files on our desktop. The first thing that we want to do is we want to install VirtualBox software. In order to create virtual machine, we must first have the software installed, so let us do that first. If we double click on it, it will start the process of installation, which should look the same whether you're running Windows, Mac OS or Linux, the process of installation VirtualBox will be the same. And it is rather easy since all we want to do is we want to click on next on each and every step, but just so we don't go next, 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 let us explain what you can do with each and every step of installation. So here, as it says under the custom setup, we want to select the way we want our features to be installed. And the only thing that you might consider changing right here is this location part. If you want to change the location of VirtualBox, you can do that right here, but since I won't be doing that, I will just click on next to proceed to the next step. Here you can select whether you want a shortcut on the desktop, whether you want start menu entries, I will leave all of this to be checked since I want all of that, and I will click on next step. For this step, it says that during the installation we might be disconnected from the internet in case you're downloading or uploading something important, so best thing you can do in that case is wait for that download or upload to finish, and then you can proceed with the installation of VirtualBox. So I will just click on yes, since I'm not doing anything important over the internet, and I will click right here on install. This will ask me for my administrative password, and since I don't have one I will simply just click on yes, and it will start the process of installing VirtualBox. This will finish in just a few seconds, and right after it, it should open up our VirtualBox. So just at this last step of our installation, we want to click on finish, and in just a few seconds, this should open the VirtualBox. And here it is. So, your window should look exactly like mine does, and what we want to do from here is we want to create the virtual machine. We're going to go onto this new button and click on it, which will open this small window that will ask us for some information about our virtual machine. So, under the name, we're going to specify Kali Linux, and you can name it anything you want, it doesn't have to be Kali Linux, but just in case you might have multiple machines in VirtualBox later on, you want to have them named properly so you know which machine is which. Next thing, the machine folder is something that we don't want to change. The type we want to set on Linux, and you will notice if you typed Kali Linux, it should automatically set the type to be Linux. 
and diversion is something that we do want to change. Now, since Kali Linux is a Debian-based operating system, we want to be searching Debian right here. And here it is, we got Debian 32-bit and Debian 64-bit. If you downloaded the 64-bit version of Kali Linux, you want to select right here Debian 64-bit. And if you downloaded the 32-bit one, you would be selecting Debian 32-bit. After we got all these options set like this, we want to click on Next. And this next step is, if you remember, we talked about that we need to give our hardware resources to our virtual machine. And right here it asks us how much RAM memory are we willing to borrow to the virtual machine to use. This RAM memory will not be available as long as our virtual machine is running and once the virtual machine has been shut down, this RAM memory will be freed for our physical machine to use. Now, on this machine that I'm recording, I have 8 GB of RAM. So, in the best case, I want to give about 2 GB of RAM to this virtual machine. Now, I can also go up to 4 GB of RAM, but it is not really needed, and there is no point in giving half of your RAM memory to your virtual machine, so 2 GB of RAM will be more than enough for my virtual machine. If your machine has 16 GB of RAM or 32 GB of RAM, feel free to give it even more RAM memory as the more the better. And if your machine has less than 8 GB of RAM, for example it has 4 GB of RAM, then you can either go with 2 GB or you can even lower it to 1 GB of RAM. But I will simply just leave it at 2 and I will proceed to the next step. In the next step we are creating the hard disk, so we want to select this option that says create a virtual hard disk now and keep in mind that the recommended size of the hard disk is 8 GB. This option will come later on, but just keep it in mind. So create the virtual hard disk now, click on create and under the hard disk file type we want to select virtual box disk image. Click on next. This next question is asking us how we want to store our data on our virtual hard disk whether we want fixed size or dynamically allocated. Keep in mind that fixed size will probably work faster, but it will also take longer time to create, while the dynamically allocated might work a little bit slower, but it will be created a lot faster. It is completely up to you. In this case, I will simply just go with dynamically allocated, and I will click on next. And here is where we choose the virtual hard disk size and the file location. So here you can change the location of your virtual hard disk, or simply of your virtual machine. And down here you can select how much gigabytes you want to give to your virtual machine to use as a hard disk. It said before that 8 gigabytes is recommended, but I would advise you to not go below 20 gigabytes. For the purposes of this course I will even go up to 30 gigabytes, but you don't really have to if you don't want. Just keep in mind that you might be using this machine later on, even after this course, and you might be downloading more and more files, so if you can, make sure to give it more than it is recommended. Once you select your hard disk size, you want to click on Create. And this will create our virtual machine, as you can see right here, we got Kali Linux added, and here are all of the details about our virtual machine. Before we proceed and start it, there is only one more thing that we want to do. Remember this ISO image, or this operating system? We need to somehow add it to our virtual machine, so that once we install the operating system, it knows which one to install. So to do that, we navigate back to VirtualBox, we select the virtual machine, and we click on Settings. Now you will notice that there are a bunch of settings right here, which we are going to explain later on, but for now on, we want to navigate to the storage, and here is where we want to add our ISO image of Kali Linux. To do that, we want to go to this controller IDE, and this empty part, we want to right click and remove attachment. It will ask us are we sure that we want to delete it, we click on remove, and after it, we want to click on this disk shape with a plus, just click on it, and it will open up this smaller window where we want to find our Kali Linux ISO image and select it. In case you don't see it right here, you want to click on Add, Are you scared? 
and you can simply just find it on your machine. In my case, as we can see, it is right here in the download section, but in your case, if you moved it to a desktop, it will probably be on desktop as well. Since I have it in both locations, I will select the desktop one, double click it, and you will see it being added right here. Then you select it here, and click on choose. You should see it being added right here under the controller IDE as it says Cal Linux 2020.2 and once you see it, you can simply just click on OK. And now our virtual machine is fully created. All we are left to do in the next video is to install the Cal Linux operating system. After that, we're going to be ready to use our hacking machine. OK, finally, we got to the part where we will install our machine all the interesting hacking tools that we will use. Hopefully you are excited since by the end of this video you will have your Cal Linux machine running and ready to use. Here in our virtual box, in order to start the process of installation, we must first select our virtual machine and then click on this start button right here. This will start our virtual machine and it will start the process of installation of operating system. Ok, so let me enlarge this. Even though the screen of the installation will stay smaller size, but that is just during the installation, so don't worry. And right here in the installer menu, we're interested in two different options. Either graphical install or install. They're pretty much the same, just graphical install is prettier, so that's why we're going to go with that one. Click here enter. The next thing it asks us is to choose the language and for the purposes of this course, I will proceed with English and you can pick whichever language you want. So just select whichever language you want, I will select English and I will click on continue. In the location part, this is only important if you want to have the correct time zone corresponded with your country and right here it also tells us that these countries from which we can choose are strictly based on the language that we picked in the previous step. So in case your country is not on the list, like mine isn't, you can go right here on Other and select your country. If it is on the list, select it and click on Continue. Now since this really isn't that important step, I will just proceed with the United States. And here under the configuration of the keyboard, I will select American English and I will click on Continue. After setting up our keyboard, the installation process will configure some stuff required for our machine to run and you will notice most of the stuff is done automatically, so we don't need to worry about it too much. Whenever a certain question pops up, I will tell you what you need to select to proceed to the next step of installation. Ok, so after a few seconds, here is the first question. Let us read what it wants from us. So it says, please enter the hostname for this system, and the hostname is a single word that identifies your system to the network. If you don't know what your hostname should be, consult your network administrator. You if you're setting up your own home network, you can make something up here. Ok, so we're not network administrators, therefore we can just make something up as a hostname, so let us just go with Kali. Why not? And let us go on continue. Domain name, this is something that we want to leave empty, so just delete everything right here and proceed to the next step. Ok, so we got setup users and password step. Now, in the previous versions of Kali Linux, it usually asked you to set up the password for the root account. And unlike, for example, on Windows, we got the user accounts and administrator. On Linux, we got the user accounts and a root account. What a root account is, is basically the same as an administrator in Windows, it has elevated privileges, it can execute commands that user's account cannot execute, and in this newest version of Kali Linux, we are required to set up a user account. So here we got the step where we need to specify full name for the new user, and it tells us that specifying our full name would be a reasonable choice, and if it was any other course instead of a hacking course, I would also tell you to specify your name here. But I must teach you to also think like a hacker, and we hackers want to stay as low-key as possible, so specifying our real name is not an option for us here. We can just make something up instead. Let us go with Mr. Hacker. Why not? 
let's click on continue and the username we can also leave to be mr hacker there's nothing really to change here of course if you want you can specify something other than mr hacker it is completely up to you just make sure you remember the username since you will need it to log into your machine after the installation so i will leave it on mr hacker and click on continue and here is a step where we need to choose a password now password is the important stuff we must make sure we choose a strong password for any type of account we create let me tell you one interesting fact a lot of black hat hackers were caught because they had a weak password we are white hat hackers but it is still a good practice to always choose a long and strong password so let us do it i will type mine right here and re-enter the password i will type it once again you can choose any password that you want in case you want to make sure that you typed what you wanted to type you can click right here show password in clear as well as in the second step you can also check show password in clear and after you choose your password you can click on continue so here configure the clock you can select your time zone i will go with eastern and here, after loading a few more additional components, it should ask us about this partitioning. Here in the partitioning disk, we have a few options, and we're interested in the first one, which is guided to use entire disk. We're not really interested in encrypted hard disks or anything like that, so just select use entire disk and click on continue. Here we get a warning that all data on the disk you select will be erased. And this right here is a hard disk that we created in the previous video when I created my virtual machine. And you remember that I gave around 30 gigabytes to my virtual hard disk. So this is that one. And I will select it and click on continue. Here it gives us some of the options as to how the disk can be partitioned. We will proceed with first option which is all files in one partition. Which is also recommended for new users. Don't worry about these other two options which mention slash home, slash var, slash tmp. These are all just standard Linux directories, which we will see shortly after installation. So just click right here, all files in one partition, click on continue. The final steps are finish partitioning and right changes to disk, we want to click on continue there as well. And right here it will just ask us are we sure that we want to write the changes to the disk? We want to select right here, yes. And we want to click on continue. So after clicking on continue, the installation process will start and it will take some time. It can take possibly around 20 to 30 minutes, maybe even longer. And it will also ask us a couple more questions in meantime. I will fast forward to the first question that pops up. And you just pause the video until you get to that step of installation. Okay, so here is the next question, configuring the package manager, and it asks us for the HTTP proxy information. Leave blank for none, and we do want to leave blank, so we're not going to type anything here, and we're going to click on continue. Here in the software selection, we want to leave all of the checked things, and we also want to add the large option. So leave everything checked that you see right here and click right here on large. What this will do is it will install additional tools in our Cal Linux and we want as many hacking tools installed with our operating system so we don't have to waste time installing them later on. So just double check that all of these options are checked, desktop environment, XFCE, these lower three and the large option as well should be checked. After you get all of that, click on continue. And this step of installing software will take some time. So just go grab a cup of coffee or take some snack and I will see you in around 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, so after a long, long installation, here is another question. And it asks us, should we install the grab bootloader to the master boot record? First of all, what is Grub? Well, Grub Bootloader is a software that loads Linux kernel. It is the first software that is started at system boot. Let us read what it asks us here. It seems that this new installation is the only operating system on this computer 
If so, it should be safe to install the ground boot loader to the master boot record of your first hard drive. Warning! If the installer fails to detect another operating system that is present on your computer, modifying the master boot record will make that operating system temporarily unbootable, though Grub can be manually configured later to boot it. We want to click here, yes. And you might be asking, wait Alexa, but I'm running other operating systems. I'm running Mac OS or Windows. Don't worry, remember, this is a virtual machine. It doesn't know about your main operating system. For this virtual machine, this is the only operating system that is being installed. So it is safe to select yes and proceed to the next step. And in here, we want to select slash dev slash sda and click on continue. This will proceed to finish up our installation and it might ask us a question or two more and then we should be ready to use our Cal Linux machine. Ok, and this final step says installation complete, so it is time to boot into your new system. Make sure to remove the installation media so that you boot into the new system rather than restarting the installation. Since we don't have an installation media, and this is probably referring to a USB drive in case you install an operating system over USB, and we didn't, we installed it in virtual machine, so we can simply just click on continue. This will finish up the installation, and then it will reboot our machine and open up our Cal Linux desktop. Here it is, our virtual machine is starting up for the first time. Finally, here is our login screen to our Cal Linux machine. Here we want to input the username that we typed in during the installation, so in my case it is Mr. Hacker. And down here you want to input the password that you used during the installation. Then you can click on login. And here it is, our first hacking machine. Now, in case you're wondering why is it smaller screen, well, to fix that, in most cases you can simply just do this, lower the screen, and then enlarge it once again, and now it should be in full screen mode. In case this didn't work, don't worry, in the next video we're going to perform some of the checks of our virtual machine, to check the internet connection, whether it is in full screen mode, and other things as well, so don't worry if your machine isn't in full screen mode, it will be after the next video. Hello and welcome back. In this video I want to touch on a subject of new releases of Kali Linux. So, inside the course we use a release 2020.2, but I already mentioned that new versions of Kali Linux are coming out every 2 or 3 months, and today we actually have a new release. This is Kali Linux 2020.4, it came out on November 18th, 2020, and right now, in this short video, we're going to just take a look at what are the new things that we get with this release. So, let's click on this article of Cal Linux, or we can just go to blog and visit Cal Linux 2020.4 release. Okay, amazing. So if we scroll a little bit down, it will tell us exactly what are the new things that we get in this new release compared to the previous one, which is 2020.3, which came out in August 2020. So the most important thing that you will notice is the new shell. And by the way, don't worry if you don't understand most of the things that I talk about in this video. All of these things we're actually going to cover in future videos. This is more of an update video just to show you what is new in this release compared to the one that we use inside the course. And I will also show you later where you can download previous releases if you want to. So what we get with this new version of Cal Linux is the ZSH, and this is the new default shell as it says right here. If I go and open my Cal Linux 2020.4, in order to show you how ZSH looks like, all I need to do is open terminal and it pretty much looks like this. Now once again terminal is something that we will cover in the next section so don't worry about that either. But this is the new terminal compared to the previous one. And all of the commands work the same, everything works the same, it just looks a little bit different. And we can actually take a look at that right here. This is how the terminal changed over the time in different versions of Cal Linux. So you can see these images right 
here. Okay, great. If you want to, I'm not going to read all of this, of course, this was supposed to be a shorter video, but you can read about all of the new things that we get with this new release, such as new tools, new updates, we get message login, we get partnership with tools, authors, so we actually get some additional tools right here. And one more thing I want to talk about before I end this video is if for some reason you want to follow on the same Calvinix version as I did in this course, you can go onto this page, which is all.cali.org slash cali-images, and you will have all of the previous Cali Linux versions available to download right here. The one that we use inside the course is 2020.2, but I always encourage you to download the newest one, and there are not many things different in the newest Cali Linux version, everything will work the same that we do in the course, but if you want, you can download any of the previous versions as well. Nonetheless, let's not make this any longer and let's get straight into getting ourselves familiar with Kali Linux. See you in the next video. Alright, we got our hacking machine running and ready to use. Before we get to explaining all of the stuff you see on the screen, first we need to make sure our machine is working properly. So we'll just go through a few checks. The first check that we want to do is is your machine in full screen mode. Now, in the previous tutorial, I showed you what you can do to get it in full screen mode, and all you need to do is minimize this screen and maximize it once again, in case it already wasn't in full screen mode. And that is because newest versions of Kali Linux automatically set your machine to be in full screen mode without installing any additional tools for that. Usually, this trick should work. And if it didn't work, and your machine is still not in full screen mode, then we need to install something called VirtualBox Guest Editions. And I would advise all of you to do it, even if you already have a full screen mode machine. Because Guest Editions will not only help us with uh, getting our machine to be full screen, but they will also make our machine run smoother and better. In previous versions of Cal Linux, we always had to install VirtualBox Guest Editions to get the full screen mode, so let us see how we can do that in the newest version as well. First we need to do is we need to go up here and click on Devices, then navigate down to the Insert Guest Edition CD image and click on that. They should get imported and in just a few seconds we should see a disk icon on our desktop. If we double click it, it will open a folder where we will see a bunch of files and other directories. Don't worry, we don't need to know what each of these files are or what do they do. The only thing we need to remember is the path to where these files are. And up here we can see that these files are located at slash media slash cdrom0. So let us copy this. If we right click, copy. Now comes the fun part. We have to open something called Terminal. And Terminal is something that we will use for the entire course. It is the most important tool you need to master as a hacker. But for now, just follow what they do and we will explain things as we go. To open a terminal, right click on your desktop and click on Open Terminal here. It will open this window where we can execute our commands. And once again, since Terminal is an important tool that you must master and learn from scratch, we will cover it in the next section in greater details. For now on, we just want to install VirtualBox Guest Editions. The first thing that we want to do is we want to navigate to that path that we copied. And to do that using Terminal, we must use a command called CD. This CD command stands for changing directories, and you can see that we are currently on the desktop directory, which says right here. To change the directory, we type the cd command and then we paste the path where we want to go. So, change directory, slash media, slash cd-rom. Press enter and you will see that in the next line we will be changing directories to the desired folder. Now, to list all the files inside of this directory, we need to type another command which is called ls. What this command stands for is simply just listing the contents of the current directory. 
so you can just remember ls to be a short command for list. If I press here enter, we will see a bunch of the files that are located in the current directory. These files are actually the files that we saw once we opened these VirtualBox guest editions. You can see these are the same files. Right now we are just there inside of our terminal. And out of all of these files, now we must run one of them. Can you guess which one? We know that we can't run the exe files since those are aimed for Windows systems and we are on a Linux system. But we can, however, run this one called VirtualBox Linux Editions.run. If you guessed that one, congrats! This is the one that we will run. To run it, we can use a command that says sh VirtualBox Linux Editions run and this sh is just a way for us to actually run this file which we are also going to explain once we get to explaining terminal in greater details for now on if we press enter hmm this program must be ran with administrator privileges aborting for now don't think about this and just run the following command sudo sh virtualbox Linux additions dot run. If we press enter here, you should get a prompt like this asking you for your password. Then type in your password. And keep in mind that even while you're typing, you will not be able to see anything appear right here, which doesn't mean that you're not typing, you are typing, just it doesn't show anything inside of the terminal. Once you typed in the password, click enter and it will ask us do we want to continue with the installation we want to specify right here yes and it will start the process of installing VirtualBox guest editions now you will notice that this entire process will be performed automatically we do not need to do anything anymore this will install on its own and don't worry if there is a part of this entire process that you did not understand we will discuss all of these commands and tools later on. This installation right here will take a minute or two, so let us just wait for that to finish. Okay, so it has finished and we can see right here that it tells us running kernel modules will not be replaced until the system is restarted. What this simply means is that this installation will not have any effect until we reboot or restart our machine. So there are two ways that we can do that. You can either go in right corner right here, click on this and click on restart. Or you can do it in the cool way using terminal. So if I cancel here and go back to my terminal and type the command reboot, it will say command not found. And if you get this message as well, what we want to do, we want to type sudo and then once again reboot, press enter and this will restart our machine for us with just one command that we ran in terminal. Now we are ready to perform the second check. And the second check would be internet connection. So we want to see whether we can access the internet. And to check that, we are going to use our terminal once again. And we will try to ping Google. So, let us open up our terminal. We already know how to do that. Right click and then open terminal here. And if we receive responses back from Google, that means we can access the internet. So let's check it out. Type ping google.com. And here it is. We're getting responses back. Great, we can access the internet. To stop this, we must press Ctrl C. As we can see right here, 21 packets transmitted, 21 received, and 0% packet loss. But even though we can access the internet, I want to point one thing out. If we go to settings of our virtual machine, and we select the virtual machine, navigate to settings, and from the settings, navigate to network settings, we will notice that we are attached to NAT. And what NAT is, is a network address translation. This means that the IP address that our Cal Linux machine has will be given to us by VirtualBox. 
So if I go to my Cal Linux and in the terminal type sudo ifconfig, press enter, enter my password, here we will see that we got the IP address of 10.0.2.15. And this is the IP address given to us by VirtualBox. Since this can present us a problem later on, we want our IP address to be received from our DHCP or from our router. And before I show you how to do that, I want to point out why this could present us a problem. Well, this IP address right here does not belong to the IP range of my local area network. If I go to my Windows machine and open up command prompt to check out the IP address on my physical machine, I can type right here ipconfig and I will see right here that the IP address that my physical machine has starts with 192.168.1 and this is not the same IP range, it starts with 10.0.2 so I want to change this to start as my physical machine with 192.168.1 to do that my Cal Linux must receive the IP address from my router and for all of you Mac users, you can also type in ifconfig in your terminal on your Mac. Basically, you can check the IP address of your Mac the same way that we did inside of our Cal Linux by typing ifconfig. And all we need to do to change this IP address is go to the network settings and switch from NAT to bridged adapter. This will automatically set my bridged adapter and my adapter to be this one, since this is the only one I have, and since I'm connecting over cable connection, I want to go to the advanced and check right here, cable connected. You can select your adapter right here, and once you do, click on OK. Just one more thing before we click on OK. In case your wireless adapter is not working in Cal Linux, since there are some wireless adapters that are not supported by Cal Linux yet, keep in mind that the cable connection will always work. So if your wireless adapter doesn't work, just switch the adapter to cable connection and then press on OK. Now that we change this, if I go back to my Cal Linux machine and run the same command which is sudo ifconfig, now it starts with 192.168.1. And keep in mind that for you it might start differently, it doesn't have to start with these three numbers, it might be something like 192.168.0 or it might be something like 10.1.1 or 10.0.1 it depends on your network so now we can see that both of these IP addresses are starting the same okay great now that we went through both of the checks for the full screen and network connection in the next few lectures, we can proceed to get more familiar with the Cal Linux environment and hackers terminology. See you there. It is time we slowly start getting into penetration testing process. For now, we didn't yet perform any hacking, but we are getting there. It is important we get the basics first and that we know why we do everything. And trust me, later in the course, we will be doing some serious stuff and everything will make sense because we covered all the basics first and we didn't just jump into something without any preparation. So in this video we will be briefly talking about stages of penetration test. How does it go? In which order do we perform the steps? And which steps are crucial? For now on we got our virtual lab set up. We installed Cal Linux and all the tools that hackers use are now available for us in our machine. We also performed some configuration to it to get it full screen as well as performed setup for internet connection. From now, the basic steps that we are going to do is we will use our Cal Linux machine to scan and attack different machines, networks, websites and accounts. But how are we going to do that? Do we just magically attack it? And do we just install virus on their machine somehow? And if so, how do we do that? What about Trojans, password cracking or phishing? Is that what we do? Well, that is just a small portion of a penetration test. First thing and most important thing before we even start a penetration test on a target is to figure out do we have permission to attack this target? 
This is very important since you don't want to be attacking machines or target networks that you do not have permission to attack. It could be that client told me to only test one machine on the network and not the entire network. Therefore, I'm only allowed to test that one machine. Or it could be that our client has multiple networks and they only allowed us to test one of them. That means you should not go around and try to hack different machines on a different network. Now, these are only some of the examples, but what's important to get out of this is that always have permission to perform a penetration test. Trying to hack or hacking something that you are not allowed to hack could potentially get you into some serious trouble if you get caught. Now that we got that out of the way, let us finally talk about different stages of penetration testing. We already know that there are five of them and the first one is reconnaissance or information gathering. Now, reconnaissance is the act of gathering information about your target to better plan out your attack. And this step of penetration testing is the only one that you can perform on any website or target that you want, since gathering information about something is not illegal. There are two ways that we can go about doing information gathering, actively, by directly interacting with our target, or it can be done passively without interacting with the target. A simple example of this would be, let's say you want to gather information for Facebook and you would do it actively by visiting Facebook page and getting all the information that you can from the Facebook page itself, while passively it would be if you went to some other website that talks about Facebook and you get information about Facebook from that other website. This would mean you never interacted with Facebook, therefore you performed a passive information gathering. After this step comes scanning. Here is where you can start getting in trouble if you do it without permission. Scanning is a deeper form of information gathering using technical tools to find openings in the target and in the system that you're attacking. These openings can be gateways, open ports, operating systems that the target runs, and so on and so on. In this step, we also perform vulnerability scanning, which is just searching for vulnerable software in the target system or network that could possibly be exploited. After information gathering and scanning comes third step, which is gaining access or so-called exploitation. And this is the step where we actually hack the target. We use information that we gathered in phase one and phase two, a control of any number of target devices. Gaining access of target devices allows us to steal data from their system or to use those devices to attack other devices on the same network. Usually, after this step, you can consider penetration tests to be successful since you managed to gain access to a target system. However, this is not the last step of a penetration test. After exploitation comes maintaining access. This step, with the fifth step, is sometimes optional. You might not need to always perform last two steps since client might only care whether their system is penetrable. Therefore, you prove them it is after the third step. If there was a vulnerability, of course. However, maintaining access is also important step and it is commonly done by installing backdoors and planting rootkits. What a backdoor and rootkits are, are simply programs that will allow us to gain access to that target whenever we want, without the need to exploit it again. We just connect to the backdoor that we planted in the target system and there it is, we are again on their machine. And last step of penetration test is covering tracks. Covering tracks is simply removing all evidence that an attack ever took place. This can involve deleting or hiding files, editing logs, or basically reverting any changes that you did to the system while the attack took place. Okay, so these five steps are the entire process of a penetration test, and we're going to cover them in great detail throughout our course. Keep in mind that these steps should be performed in order. And one more important thing is, in case you're a beginner, you might think that third step, which is exploitation or gaining access, is the most important step of the process. 
Even though it is very important and crucial, the most important steps are actually information gathering and scanning. It is in these two steps that we gather information about the target and discover vulnerabilities, so if you are not that good in gathering information, you might miss some things that could be used to gain access to the machine, therefore preventing you to find an actual vulnerability. So just keep that in mind, that information gathering is 70% of work. Ok good, so we talked a little about these phases, but before we get to perform each one of these steps, we must first get a little familiar with our Cal Linux machine. In the next few lectures, we are going to get into details about terminal and some of the commands we can run and execute with it. See you there! Welcome back! Here we are in our Cal Linux machine and it is time we finally learn how to use that mysterious tool that is said to be the most important tool that we must master. Don't worry, terminal is not difficult to use. But before we get to open it and run a bunch of the commands, let us first define what terminal is. So what is it? Terminal is a program that allows us to interact with Linux operating system using different commands. We can create files, delete files, create directories, run programs, set different tasks to execute and we can do many more things using it. It is important you get used to it, especially if you never used it before. Because if you are coming from Windows or Mac OS, you probably are used to opening files or folders by clicking on different icons and navigating like that. For example, on Windows, we usually open files by double clicking on an icon and it will open that folder. And on Linux we can actually do the same thing. So if I go right here and for example I want to open this home folder, I will double click on that folder and it will open a folder with all the files inside of it. But we don't want to be doing it like that. Let us see how we can do it using terminal. So let us close this first and we already know how to open terminal, right click on desktop and click open terminal here. First thing that we notice is the username that we have right here and the host name that we have right here. But we also notice this slash desktop. This means that our terminal process has opened inside of the desktop directory. Does it always open there? Nope. It only opened there because we told it to open there. Remember, we right clicked on desktop and clicked open terminal here. If we for example went to the home folder and right clicked here, open terminal, hmm, it doesn't say slash home like it did in desktop. It just gives us this wavy minus sign. Well, that sign in Linux means that you are in your home directory of your user. And our user is called Mr. Hacker, so the directory name should be slash home slash Mr. Hacker. And to check the directory name, we can type the command pwd. If we press enter, it will give us the current directory in which our terminal process is running. And it is slash home slash Mr. Hacker. And this pwd simply just stands for print working directory. If we for example go to the folder once again, which is slash home folder slash Mr. Hacker, and we double click on documents, try to open terminal here, so open terminal here, this will open a second terminal and you will see right here that it says slash documents. But do we always need to go to that folder and open terminal inside of that folder for it to be inside of this directory? Of course not. We can use a command called cd. And you should be familiar with this command since we already used it before. Let us test it out. Let's go to the documents directory from our home directory. So I'll just close this second terminal. And right here we are inside of our home directory. Or slash home slash Mr. Hacker. 
we know that inside of this directory there is a documents directory since we managed to open it right here and to navigate to this directory using terminal we can use the command cd and then the name of the directory which is documents we press enter and here it is we are in slash documents directory if we type pwd here it will tell us the current working directory is slash home slash mr hacker slash document and for example if we wanted to go one step or one directory back we can type the command cd and then two dots what this command will do is it will go one directory back and if i type pwd once again we will now be again in slash home slash mr hacker directory so these two dots tell the terminal to go one directory back okay great but how can we know which subdirectories and files are in home directory for example we knew there was a documents directory in home folder because we opened it right here we didn't open it over terminal we opened it right here from our desktop once we open it again we can see all the folders and files inside of this slash home slash mr hacker directory but we didn't see these files inside of our terminal so how can we list them how can we see all of these files using terminal so we know which directories are available inside of this slash home slash mr hacker directory to check files and folders in any directory we can use another familiar command which is ls and the ls command stands for list so let's just test it out if we type it press enter here we are we can see same folders and same files that we can see inside of this window right here so what we did for now is we used terminal instead of clicking on bunch of files bunch of icons we now are doing all of that with our terminal now that we know which folders are in this directory we can choose which folder we want to go to and use cd command to go there but let us go one directory back from the slash home slash mr hacker to do that we already know we can type cd and then two dots and by the way cd simply stands for changing directory don't know if i mentioned that but cd is changing directory and now we can see once we went one directory back we are in slash home directory if we type ls here we can see here is our mr hacker directory that is containing these files right here since we went one step back we can only see mr hacker directory since this is the only folder inside of the slash home directory let's go one more step back if i type cd two dots once again now i am in slash directory and it is called slash directory because it is only specified as a forward slash and we can go more than that this is the main directory that has all of the other files and directories in the system if we try to type cd once again you will see it will still be in the slash directory and remember when i told you during cal linux installation that we will shortly see slash home slash tmp slash var directories that occurred in one of the installation questions well if i type ls right here here they are these are all just standard linux directories and here is slash home from which we came from here is slash var and here is tmp and a bunch of other directories and these are all just standard linux directories from here you will notice that not all of it is same color this is because not all of the stuff we see here is the same thing something is a directory something is a file and for example we cannot use cd command onto a file we can only use cd to go to another directory so if we try for example cd and i choose this file so cd in it rd.img and press enter 
this will not work. It will give us an error saying not a directory. But if we type cd and then add c for example, which is this directory, and press enter, now I will be inside the add c directory. And here I can type ls to list all of the files inside of the add c directory. And you will also notice that here we got a mixture of files and directories as well. Directories are these dark blue names, while files can be other colors depending on file type. Usually they are white. Okay, great. We learned the basics of navigating through Linux system and directories using different commands. Now, before we finish this video, here is a practice test. Try returning to the desktop directory from this at C directory using only the commands that we learned. I will give you right now a few seconds and I will show you how to do it. So, try it out. Okay, don't worry if you didn't get it. This will come with practice, so here it is how we can do it. From the atc directory, we know that we must go back to the slash directory. And in the slash directory, we got our home directory. We can check it out by typing ls. And inside of this home directory, we know that we got the Mr. Hacker directory, and the Mr. Hacker directory has the desktop directory. So to navigate there, we can type cd home, type ls here, then type cd Mr. Hacker, type ls here once again to check out all of the available directories, and cd desktop. And now we are on our desktop directory once again. Great! So, practice a little bit with these commands. This is nothing really too hard, just take some practice and you will get used to it pretty soon. And in the next video, we're going to see how we can create files and folders using terminals, as well as we're going to see how we can run programs. See you there. Okay, so we know how to find our way to the desired directory in terminal, but what if we need to create a file or a subfolder in another directory? How can we do that? Well, first, let's open up our terminal. And by the way, Another way that you can open terminal, instead of right-clicking and going open terminal here, is going up here to this icon, which says terminal emulator, and clicking on it. By default, this will be inside of your home directory, which we know to be this sign, and if we type the pwd command, we get slash home slash Mr. Hacker directory. We know that our desktop directory is also inside of this directory, so let's go there cd desktop, press enter, and now we are in the desktop directory. Let's get back to the files. To create a simple empty file, we can use a command called touch. If I simply just type touch file, and let's call it file1, press enter, this will create a file named file1, and it will have no contents inside of it. We can also see that file1 has been created, as it is right now on our desktop, since we created it inside of the slash desktop directory, and if we also type ls, we can see that the file is in our desktop directory. To make sure this file is indeed empty, we can use the command cat, and this command, once executed on a file, writes out all the contents that are inside of that file. Let's try it out. So we specify cat, and then file1, press enter, and this will give no result since, as we already mentioned, the touch command creates empty files. If we want to, for example, put something inside of that file, we can use a command echo. You simply just type it like this, echo, and to put something, you specify after the echo, let's say today is a really good day. So we specified an entire sentence, and all we need to do to put this sentence inside of this file is to specify this arrow to the right. And after it specified the name of the file that we want to put this sentence in. So echo, today is a really good day, into the file 1. 
press enter. And if we cat it once again with the cat command, so cat file 1, we will see that now it outputs exactly what we've written to that file using the echo command. Okay, that's all good, but there is an easier way and more practical way to do all of this. We can use a text editor to write things inside of a file. And an easy text editor that we can run from terminal is called nano. So let's try to do the same thing we just did using nano. If we type nano, and after nano comes the name of the file that you want to edit, and since we want to edit a new file that we haven't created yet, we can simply just type name, let's call it file2, and press enter. This will open this empty window where we can type anything we want. We can type file content here, and it can be anything. We can type, for example, text here, but we could also type code if we wanted to. Let's start with text first. Let's write just hello world as a text. To save this, we press Ctrl O together, then enter to save under this name, and then Ctrl X to exit the nano editor. If we now type cat and then file 2, and by the way, we can notice that file 2 has been created along file 1 on our desktop, but if we cat file 2, we can see the output of hello world. So we managed to do it only using one tool, which is nano, instead of using two tools, which are touch and echo. But I also mentioned we can do the same thing with programs. For example, how can we create a Python program using nano and terminal? First we need to open a file. So let's type nano and then file3.py and in this case we add .py because that is an extension for Python programs. Then inside of it, after pressing enter, we are going to run a simple command, which is print and then hello world between the quotes. And you will see that some stuff changes colors. This is because the nano editor recognizes this as a Python program. What we did right here, in case you're not familiar with Python, is we just ran a simple function that will print out the string that is in between the quotes. So this will just print out hello world. Let's save it with Ctrl O, then press enter and then Ctrl X to exit. And luckily for us, Python is already installed in Cal Linux. So all we need to do to run this program is to type python3 and then the name of the file. file3.py Press enter and the program will execute. Here it printed out hello world. Cool, right? You will also notice that the icon is different than these two icons. This is also once again because this is recognized as a Python program. It even has the Python icon. Now that we know how to create files and execute Python programs, the next question would be how can we create directories? To create a directory, we can use the command mkdir, which stands for make directory. To check it out, let us run mkdir and name a directory folder. So press enter, and if I type ls, we will see that we got our files as well as a directory which is different color, and it is called folder. Remember, we differentiate them by color, and also, if we try to change directory to the folder, it will work. It will even give us the path of slash desktop slash folder. Great! In that folder, you can do pretty much anything you want. You can create subfolders, or create files, whatever you want to do, you can. To move, for example, our Python program from the desktop directory to our folder directory, we can use command mv, which stands for move. We must first navigate back to desktop directory, let's do it using cd and then two dots to go one directory back, and from it we run the command mv file3.py into the folder. So we specify move, then the second parameter is what we want to move, which in our case is file3.py, and the last parameter is where we want to move it, 
we want to move it inside of our folder. So press here enter and you will notice that the file tree.py disappeared from our desktop directory. We can also check that by typing ls and notice that our Python program is no longer here. But if we go to the folder directory and type ls here, we will see it here because we moved it. Here it is, file3.py. Now, this is a handy command and you will use it a lot. Besides moving the file, we also want to see how we can copy a file and we can do it using the cp command. This does the exact same thing as move command, but it doesn't move it from original directory to desired directory, it just copies it. So let's try to copy file3.py and call it file4.py. If I type cp, which stands for copy, file3.py, and I type file4.py right after it, this will create an exact copy of our file in the same directory. If I press enter, and type ls, here it is, we got file3.py and file4.py. If we want to change whether they are exactly the same, we can cat the content of file3.py and cat the content of file4.py. And we can see they are both the same Python programs. And last command that we want to cover regarding files is the command rm. This command deletes files and directories and let's say we try to delete file4.py that is our copy of our Python program. We can do it by typing rm and then file4.py. Now, be careful with this command, since once you delete a file, there is no trash bin where you can retrieve it, it is gone. If I type enter and type ls, you will see our file4.py is no longer there. Ok, but how do we delete a directory? Let's first create a directory inside of our folder directory, and to do that, we type mkdir and let's call it folder2. Folder2 is a subdirectory of our folder. If I type ls, here it is. And let's say we did create this directory by mistake and we want to delete it. Can we use rm folder2? Well, we can try it. Hmm, cannot remove folder2 and it will tell us that it is a directory. So how do we delete it? Well, we'll remove it in the same way we remove files, we just add an option at the end of the command. So type rm folder2 and then at the end add space and then dash r. Press enter and this will delete our directory. Also, double check what you are deleting with this command since if you go to our slash directory, which is directory containing all folders and files in system, and if we were to type, for example, in that directory rm, then this star sign, and then dash r, this command would delete entire Cal Linux machine with all of its files. So always pay attention what exactly are you deleting in Linux and from which directory are you deleting. Since inside of the Linux you will not be stopped in deleting anything you want. You can easily delete a crucial file for the operating system and make your Cal Linux machine unworkable. That is also a reason why we are practicing with virtual machine. So let's... Oops, I actually ran this and you will notice that the results of this command if I type ls, now our folder is completely empty. So I actually ran this by mistake and keep in mind if I actually ran this from the slash directory which is our root directory, I would delete entire Cal Linux system. For now on, it is good since I only deleted our Python program, so it is not a big deal. Ok, great. We learned a bunch of the commands in this lecture. Now I got a practice test for you that you can try to do for the next lecture. Inside of our folder directory, since I deleted my Python program, I want you to create the file tree.py once again. You can type anything you want inside of it. You can use the print hello world statement that we used. And what I want you to do using the commands you learned in this video is to copy that file in the desktop directory from our folder directory. So you create it inside this directory and I want you to copy it back to the desktop directory. A hint is that it can be a little tricky once you copy file from some directory to directory, 
Anyways, just try it and we're going to see the solution in the next video. Welcome back. Have you managed to figure out the command from previous video? Don't worry if you haven't, since it was a tricky one. Let us see what the solution is. So if I navigate to my folder, which we created in the previous video, we want to copy our file 3.py, which is our Python program, from folder directory to the desktop directory. And if you tried to solve it but didn't manage to, you probably went with command cp file3.py desktop. And if I press enter, this command probably surprised you since it created another folder, or pardon me, another file, in the folder directory called desktop. This is because it read our command as if we wanted to copy our file into another file in the same directory, and we call that file desktop. And this is just how the command works. In order to successfully copy the file to desktop directory, we must run the command and specify the full path to the desktop as well as the name of the copy that we want. So it would look something like this. First, we're going to delete this desktop file since we don't need it. And then you specify cp file3.py and we specify the full path to the desktop which is slash home slash Mr. Hacker and then slash desktop. After it, we also want to specify slash and type here the name that we want our copy to have. So let's just call it our copy.py. We added .py since it is a Python program. Press enter and you will see right away on the desktop we got our copy.py. Now that we got that figured out, let us talk about a few network commands that we will use a lot throughout this course. The most important command we already know is ifconfig. We use ifconfig command to get our IP address and what the output of this command is, is all the network interfaces as well as IP addresses corresponding to those interfaces. If I run ifconfig, oops, we get command not found, so we must run sudo ifconfig, press enter, then we enter our password, and here I have a few interfaces. So let me enlarge the terminal so we can see entire command. Let's just fully enlarge it and run the command once again. And by the way, you can navigate to the previous commands using upper and lower arrow. So I can navigate between all the commands that I ran previously, and here is sudo ifconfig. And this is the output of my ifconfig command. For you, this will probably be different. Here I have ETH0 interface, which is my cable connection, and it has an IP address of 192.168.1.12. And I can also see the loopback interface, which is this LO, which all of us should have, and it will be an IP address of 127.0.0.1 which is also a local host IP. For this course, we will usually be interested in this ETH0 IP address. If you have another interface called differently, that is also fine. You could have a different named interface if you, for example, are connecting over Wi-Fi. This IP address that we get right here is called local IP address, which means it only works inside of our network to communicate with other devices that are also inside of our network. There is also something called public IP address, which we are going to talk about later in the course. For now, just remember that ifconfig outputs local IP address as well as our network interfaces. Another thing we can get from ifconfig is our MAC address for a specific interface. So for the ETH0 interface, here is my MAC address. And what MAC address is, is a unique identifier for every device, unlike local IP addresses that could be the same in different networks. For example, it is a great possibility that you also have the IP address starting 
with 192.168.1. While the MAC address is unique for every device in the world. And in case you're new to all of this and don't have much previous experience with MAC addresses and IP addresses, you might be asking, why do we need both of them? Well, let me explain like this. MAC addresses are unique and usable in communications with your neighbor machines or simply with machines that are on your network, while IP addresses are used to communicate over internet and they can also change. Remember it like this. MAC address tells you who you are. IP address tells you where you are. So that is the ifconfig command. And now that I think of this ifconfig command, there is one more important command that I didn't show you and that you will use a lot, which is sudo. Remember, we used it with ifconfig. Now, sudo is not a part of the ifconfig command, it is just a command that we use once we want to execute something as a root user. And just to remind you, a root user is something like an administrator. It has highest privileges above all other users. With root user, you can execute any commands that you want. For example, once we ran this ifconfig command, it told us command doesn't exist. If I just type once again, ifconfig, it will say command not found. But after using sudo ifconfig, we managed to execute it. That is because ifconfig command must be ran with root privileges in order for it to execute. Throughout this course, we will encounter many programs and many commands that will require sudo in order to run. And sometimes there could be multiple commands at once that we must execute as a root user. There is one cool trick so you don't have to type sudo before every command is to run at the beginning sudo and then su. Press enter and if you're running sudo for the first time inside of one terminal session, it will ask you for your password and then it will log in into the root terminal. So everything you run from now on, you will run as a root account. Right now, I no longer need to specify sudo ifconfig, I can just specify ifconfig. And it will not tell me command not found, it will execute it since I am a root user. As it says right here, it is no longer Mr. Hacker, it is now root. If you want to exit out of this root terminal, you simply just type exit and it will go back to your Mr. Hacker terminal. Now, this can also be applied to files. Some files might be created only for you to account to edit. For example, if we run the command sudo touch file1, we press enter. And if we, for example, type sudo nano file1, type here hello there, we control O to save and then control X to exit we won't be able to edit this file as a normal user without the sudo command or without the root account. If I lower this terminal, here is our file 1. And the reason why we can't edit it is because this actual file right now has been opened and edited with root privileges. And once we saved it, we saved it as a root. So right now if we try to nano it, it will tell me file is unwritable which means I cannot write anything, well, I mean, I can, but if we try to save it, it will tell me right here, permission denied. So let's close this and open terminal once again. However, if we go as a root account, sudo nano file one, and we type our password, now we can type anything we want. Just one second, it seems that we opened the wrong file. This is the file one that we created from the previous video that says today's a really good day. And to go to the file one that root account created, I believe it is one directory back. Or let's just go to the sudo user. Type enter, cd Mr. Hacker, cd desktop, cat file one. Never mind, since we can't really find it, let us just create another file. Just make sure you go to the root account of the terminal and then type nano test file. And once you type nano test file, here type hello there. 
save this, exit the root account, and if I lower terminal right now, we will see this test file right here on our desktop, but it also has this lock right here. This means we as a normal user cannot edit this file. We first need to go to desktop directory, so let's go to the Mr. Hacker and then desktop, and we nano test file. It will tell us once again, file is unwritable. Only root account can edit it. And this is something you will encounter a lot, so it is really important next time you see either something like command not found, or write protected file, or this requires root privileges, just know that it needs to be ran with sudo. Alrighty, so with this we finished our small crash course for Linux, and I would advise you to practice a little bit with the commands we learned, and also explore Cal Linux operating system a little bit. Go to different directories, see what it all has, but be careful not to delete some important files. Okay, now we are ready to finally go into the process of penetration testing. Hopefully you are excited since this is where the fun starts. Let us see how to perform the first phase, which is information gathering. See you there. Welcome back. It is time we learn in details what is information gathering and how can we perform it. We already know that information gathering is the first step in penetration testing and it is an act of gathering data about our target. It can be any type of data that we might find useful for the future attack. And if you remember, there are two types of information gathering. We got active information gathering and passive information gathering. And we talked briefly about them, but now it is time to fully explain what both of them are. So let's start with active information gathering. In active information gathering, we use our Cal Linux machine and we try to get as much data or as much information about our target while interacting with them. It could be a target website that we need to test, so we need to find as many things about it as we can. Or it could also be a network that we are testing, or perhaps an entire company. The main point is that with active information gathering, we directly get that data from the target. This could mean directly exchanging packets with the target by visiting and enumerating their website, or it could also mean talking to an employee that works there. We could maybe call them over mobile phone to try to get them to tell us something important, but this part is also considered social engineering. Nonetheless, any action where you exchange something with the target is active information gathering. This can be legal to an extent. If you start performing some advanced scans or OS fingerprinting on the target, you most likely won't get in trouble, but you should still not do it without permission. And it is important to mention that usually active information gathering will provide us with much more important data than passive information gathering since we are directly interacting with the target. On the other hand, we got passive information gathering. And it is similar, we got our Cal Linux machine and our target. But we also have an intermediate system or what I like to call a middle source. And what this middle source is, well, basically it could be anything. From a search engine to a website, it could also be a person, but what matters is that information we get is going through that middle source. For example, if we want to find out something about a certain target, and we google that target to find some pages that contain information about it, this is considered passive information gathering. Okay, good, but what are the goals of this? What exactly are we searching for? which information could be of value to us. Usually the first thing we search to identify a target is their IP address, or IP addresses if the target has multiple addresses that belong to them. This could be for example a company that has servers and buildings all around the world, 
And if we were to test this company, we would also be interested in their employees too. For example, we would want to gather their emails, which could be useful for a future attack to gain access to that company, or we could possibly want to gather their phone numbers, which could also be useful. But most importantly, and what we're mainly interested in, are technologies that the target has. If it was a company, we would want to know how many networks they have, what softwares are running on their machines, what operating systems they have. If it was a website, we would also want to know how that website was built, which programming languages it has, does it have JavaScript or PHP for example, just one software on one machine that is outdated or that has a known vulnerability that could be exploited is our way in. So, now that we know what we are looking for during this first step, it is time we see what tools and programs can we use to find out as much information as possible about our target. Let's do it! Welcome back! Since this is our first video in information gathering, we're going to start off with something easy. Let us see how we can identify our target and get its IP address. We're going to check how we can do this both actively and passively. Let's do it with active information gathering first. So, this means we're going to interact with our target. So just go on Google and pick a website that you want to use for this. It can be any website that you want and you can also use the ones that I will show in this video. First open up your terminal and what we're going to do for the first test I'm going to use this website. This is just some university page that I picked and what we can do to get its IP address is to ping it. Most of you will already be familiar with ping tool since it is installed by default on any operating system. By pinging this website or any other website, we're sending something called ICMP packets to that website and if we get responses back, that means that website is up and running. But what we also get besides that response is the IP address. So let's try it out. I will leave this link right here and I will just add at the beginning ping space and then hit enter. And it seems that we're not getting any responses back, but what we did get is an IP address. Here it is. And we're not getting responses back from this site because it is probably blocking ping probes, which some websites often do. Let us try another site to see how it looks once we get responses back. So to stop this, you can simply just press Ctrl Z and it will tell us 32 packets transmitted and 100% packet loss. Now this doesn't mean that this website is offline, since if we visited this link right here or this IP address, we would open a page to that website. But just in case, let us see how it looks like once we get the response back from the ping command. If we try to ping a big website, for example, like Facebook, so let's type ping, facebook.com Here we get an IP address of Facebook and we can control C since we can notice that we are getting packets back which means Facebook is up and running and also responding to our ICMP packets. Just to note this IP address right here is just one of the IP addresses that Facebook uses. So for you once you ping it you will probably get a different result. Okay. What we saw right here is an example of active information gathering to get the IP address since we directly send packets to these websites. Another tool you can use to get IP from a website is called NSLOOKUP. So if I go down here and type NSLOOKUP and then the name of the website, which in our case let's try with the first one, which is this one. And once again, you can test any website you want with this. It doesn't matter. If I press enter, it will give me this response, which says server and address right here. But this is not the IP address of this website. This is just my router. And where the result or where the IP address of this website is, is down here. 
here it is. If we compare this one and we go back to the ping command, you will notice the IP address is the same. So we got the same result, which is good. Let's try the same with Facebook, so just type right here NS lookup facebook.com and we also get the IP address of Facebook. Now, if you wanted to do this passively, you would search for this information, such as IP address, over some other website. Let us see how we can do that. First of all, we want to open our Firefox, and to do that, just click on this Cal Linux icon in the top left corner and type Firefox. You should see Firefox ECR, click on it, and what we're going to look for is a website that provides us with IP address of a different website. And since I don't know any website that does that, I will simply just go right here in the search bar and type what is an IP address of this website. If I press enter, it should probably give me a few results of different websites that will do exactly what we want, which is get the IP address of another website. And let's go with this one, IP checker, which is ipinfo.info. If I click on it, and down here we see something that says IP Domain Checker. We need to specify the IP address, the domain or URL. And if we type the domain name of that first website, so if I type the same domain name, and click right here on check, ok so some security check, select all traffic lights, let's select all traffic lights that we see. And here is the result. And you will notice that right here we get even more information than we asked for. For example, here is the IP address of this website. We also get from which country it is, as it says right here in the brackets. And we also get its geolocation, which says even the city. We can also check it out on Google Maps if we wanted to. Down here we get even more information such as reverse DNS. Here we get information about registration date, modification date, expiration date. Down here we get some of the DNS servers. And here we get its physical address. So this is the exact location to where this server is located. Now this is just the same result I believe. Down here we also get some email addresses as we can notice right here. All of this could be useful for us depending on which type of attack we would plan. Now, of course, we're not going to be attacking this website since we do not have permission, but we're simply just gathering information to see what can we retrieve from the internet about this website. And from now on, we're getting a bunch of information about it. Now, similar response that we got right here, we can get using a tool called Whois. Whois not only gives us an IP address of the specified domain, but it also gives us a bunch of other information about that domain. It is already installed in Kali Linux, so let's test it out. If I close this page and type in my terminal who is the same domain name, press enter, I will pretty much get the same information that I saw previously on that website. As we can see right here, we get those DNS servers, the registration date, modification date, expiration date, we get the physical address and some other things such as ID number, tax ID, which is not really of interest to us. And let us also test this tool on Facebook, since different websites might give different information. For example, if I do the same on Facebook, since it being a much bigger site, it will probably give us much more information as well. So let's type it. Who is? Facebook.com Press enter. Let me just enlarge the terminal so we can see everything clearly. And if I scroll all the way up, we get some name servers, text street, city, state province, postal code. We also get some phone numbers right here. Here are some of the email addresses for the tech email. So we get another email address right here and even more phone numbers. We get the city, the street, if I go all the way up, 
we can see that this is a who is response so this all information is public to us and this would be pretty much it this is all the information we get for facebook using who is tool and by the way in real penetration tests that you will perform all of the interesting information is something that you want to write down in our report for now we only saw how we can get basic information, such as IP addresses, country origin, physical address and similar, but later during information gathering and scanning, we might find something that shouldn't be out there on the internet and that would be called information disclosure. It is something that client doesn't want to be seen, but it is still publicly available. So anything that you might think is interesting, you would write down. Okay, great. Now we know how we can identify a target by getting its IP address and also getting its physical address and some other interesting information as well. And even though this isn't really hard information to get, it is a good beginning. Let us see in the next video what else can we find out. Welcome back. Now we are going to discuss a tool called WhatWeb. This tool is used to gather information and to scan any website on the internet, so it is primarily used to scan websites, since this tool recognizes web technologies including web servers, embedded devices, JavaScript libraries and many more things. They explain it really well on the website page for this tool, so we can read right here about all of the details that this tool has. We can notice they have over 1700 plugins each one of them used to recognize something different. So they use these plugins to perform the scan on the website and discover what technologies does that website run. What is important for us is this second paragraph, since down here it tells us that default level of aggression called stealthy is the fastest and requires only one HTTP request of a website. Now what this simply means is that this WhatWeb tool has different levels for scanning. And the default level is the level of aggression that is called Stealthy, which we can use on any website that we want. The other levels of scanning are more aggressive and should only be performed during penetration tests. So we should not use the more aggressive scans on the websites that we do not have permission to scan. We can, however, use the Stealthy scan on any website that we want on the internet. And don't worry, we are going to see all of these options in just a second. For now, it's good that we know what we can or cannot do. So let's test this tool out in our Cal Linux. To do it, open up your terminal. And to check out all of the options we can do with WhatWeb, you can simply just type WhatWeb in your terminal and press Enter. This will give you a smaller help menu with some of the basic features that WhatWeb has. As we can see, we can specify targets, which can be anything from URLs, host names or IP addresses. Here is that aggression level, which we specify like this. There is the aggression level 1, which is stealthy, and the aggression level 3, which is aggressive. The default level is level 1, which is good to notice, so we don't want to change this if we scan a random website on the internet. We can also list all of the plugins that it uses, but we are not currently interested in this. And we can have also a verbose output. But these are just some of the options for the WhatWeb tool. To get even more available options with WhatWeb, we can type the command WhatWeb dash dash help. Press enter, and this will give us a much larger help menu with all of the possible options that we can use for WhatWeb. And down here, here is the aggression level. We can see besides the stealthy we are going to use on random websites, and besides the aggressive scan that you would use in a penetration test, there is even more aggressive scan called heavy, and it says right here makes a lot of HTTP requests per target, URLs from all plugins are attempted. So this is basically the deepest scan that what web tool can perform on a website. Up here are also the targets, so we specify a target first, and if I go all the way down, you will notice right here we got some of the examples of usage of WhatWeb. So we can see right here that the most simple example is running WhatWeb and then the domain name. So for the first run, let us go with this one, 
we're only going to specify website as an option, so just type down here what web. And since we're using the aggression level 1, we can scan any website that we want, so I'm going to go with this one. And this is just another university website from my country. Feel free to scan any website that you want, or you can also go with this one if you'd like. If I press here enter, in just a few seconds we should get response for this website. And here it is, we already got something. Uh, we got two responses, as we can see by the links, right here. The command has finished executing, so let us just go through these results and see what we got. It tells us that it most likely performed a redirect as soon as we tried getting this link. We can also see that we got the Apache web server, we even get the version, which is 2.4.6. We got some cookies right here, which the website uses. We got from which country it is, which type of HTTP server it uses. If I go down here, here is the IP address of this website, here is the PHP version that they use, and the redirect location, if you remember I told you that it most likely redirected us to a different page, here is to where it redirected us. And once we got redirected, we got the response of 200 OK, and this is just an HTTP response code, which tells us that we successfully loaded a page. We got the same Apache version, the bootstrap version, which cookies it uses, down here we got the country, and we also managed to extract some of the emails. As we can see down here, these are some of the emails from the page that belong to this domain. Down here we also see that it uses HTML5, which HTTP server it has, which Apache version it has, once again which PHP version, the IP address, it also uses jQuery, Lightbox, and a bunch of other things we can see right here. But I don't really like how this is outputted, it is hard to read. To output this a little bit prettier, we can use this verbose option that I saw in the help menu, here it is. And what this verbose option does is, it also includes plugin descriptions. It will also tell us for each plugin that the WattWeb tool managed to discover, it will tell us what exactly that plugin is. So let's try it out. If I type WattWeb and then the same website, but I add dash V option at the end and press enter, it will pretty much give us the same result just it will be outputted a whole lot better and easier to read. If I scroll all the way up to the beginning of the command, remember we got two responses. Here is the IP address and this is the first request or first response which tells us to move to the actual website, so the redirect response. We get all of this information that we got previously, but we also get this section right here which says detected plugins. And for example, if we didn't know what Apache was, we could read right here what Apache is. And down here, we get the version that this website has of the Apache. We also get for cookies, same thing. For HTTP server, we can see which operating system, which Apache server it is, which PHP version it is. It tells us right here what PHP is, for example, if we didn't know. PHP is a widely used general purpose scripting language redirect location, so after this request it redirects us to this location, and down here we get the response 200 for the actual page. We get once again the country, the IP address, and all of the detected plugins, and we can read through this and discover what is this website running. And it is outputted a whole lot better and easier to read than the previous command. Ok, good, so we managed to get the information as to what a certain website is running, which technologies it has, and in the next video we're going to deeply go into this tool and try to perform some of the more aggressive scans as well as experiment with some of the different options of WattWeb as well. Welcome back, let's continue with our WattWeb tool. So in the previous video we only saw how we can perform the basic stealthy scan on a certain website. Another thing that we can do with WattWeb, besides testing a website, is to test a range of IP addresses all at once. So if I open up my terminal, and I type WattWeb, dash dash help, 
Once again, to list out all of the available options and scroll all the way up. Here, under the targets, we can see that we can specify URLs, host names, IP addresses, but we can also specify IP ranges. We can specify them like this or like this. Now to test this out, I'm going to scan my entire home network. And to know what range of IP addresses should I scan for my home network, I can type down here command I've config or sudo I've config since remember this requires root privileges. Press enter, enter our password and we can see that my IP address is 192.168.1.4 and what's more important than the IP address in this case is the netmask and my netmask is 255.255.255.0 The subnet mask right here means that only the last octet of my IP address is changeable which is this last number so these first three octets or these first three numbers never change in my home network. This also means that the range of IP addresses that belong to my network are going to be from 0 to 255. So basically the range of the IP addresses that my network can have is this one. 192.168.1.0 192.168.1.255 This is the range of my home network. So let me scan it. Now, for you, it might be different based on what type of network you got, but in most home networks the subnet mask is going to be this one. Therefore, just the last octet will be changeable for you. Now, before I actually run the scan, I don't have any websites hosted in my home network. But I do got some devices running something on port 80, and port 80 is an HTTP port that websites use to host their pages, so we should still get some result from scanning my network. Let us go delete this and type what web, and then the range of my home network. Let us go with 1. 192.168.1.255 So this is the range of IP addresses that I want to scan and all of them belong to my home network. And the good thing right here is that I can use whichever aggression level I want since it is my own network. Let's test out aggression level 3. To do that we can specify dash dash aggression and then 3. After it, we can also specify the dash V option to better output all of this. And let's press enter. You will notice we are getting some of the results, but there is a lot of this error happening on the screen. Now, what this error right here is, let me just control C, since we're not going to wait for this to finish. And what this error is, is all of the hosts that it tried to scan, but couldn't manage to. And the reason why it couldn't manage to scan these hosts is because they do not exist. I currently only have around 2 or 3 devices on my home network and all of these other IP addresses are out of use. So let me go up here to see what it found. It found the result for the IP address 192.168.1.1 and this is my router. Down here we can see all of the plugins that it managed to detect for my router. We can see an interesting plugin which is password field. This is something that we would write down since any password field that we find we can use later on in something like a brute force attack to try to guess the password and try to brute force the login credentials. But nonetheless this is just a router so we're not really interested in it at the moment. This is just an example of a test of how it would look like and since I don't have any website on my home network it didn't really give much result. We can see right here here is another IP address that is active, it is 192.168.1.10 and this is an IP address of my laptop which is currently up and running. It detected this HTTP server on it, but it got the status code of 403 forbidden. So it is not allowed to visit that page. Therefore, this is as much information as it managed to get. And all the other ones down here are simply just offline. 
Now if you don't want this outputted, this red text, you can use the same command and at the end add dash dash no errors. What this no errors option does is it simply just doesn't print these offline IP addresses. Let's test it out. If I run the same command, just with no errors, you will see we are not going to get any red text anymore. It will only scan these two live IP addresses, which is my home router and the laptop. And that is basically it. That is everything that it will output. Okay, so it took just a few seconds to finish. And keep in mind that since we are running level 3 of aggression scan, it will take a little bit more time to scan something than with level 1 since it is performing a deeper scan than just the level 1 stealthy scan. Ok, so we ran this command and we used the aggression level 3, we used dash v to output all the detected plugins as well as their description, and we used no errors to not print out these offline IP addresses. But what if we for example wanted to save this output that we got in a file for some future references? Well, if I type the command watweb dash dash help and I go through this help menu once again, I will get to this part which is logging. And down here we can see that there are a bunch of options that we can use to log our file or to save our file. So let's just go with the first one. Or we can even use the second one, which is to log verbose output. To do that, we use this option right here, and then equals, and then the file name that we want it to save to. So if I go down here, and another useful command, once you have a bunch of things happening in your terminal, and by bunch of things I mean just a bunch of text printed out, what we can do to get rid of this is run the command clear. This will clear our terminal, so we get much cleaner look. Now if I press upper arrow, to find the command that we ran previously and at the end I add log and then dash verbose equals and here I can call the file results for example. If I press here enter, now you will notice that the size of this outputting it to the terminal, it will also save it inside of a file. Let's wait for this to finish to check out the file that we got. Ok, so it finished, let us clear the screen once again, and if I type ls right here, we will see our results file. Let's lower the terminal and open this file to see what it got saved, and if I enlarge it, we will see that we got our results saved. For both IP addresses, for my laptop IP address, and for my router IP address. Now. For your scan, if you scan your home network, you will probably have more devices or less devices, or you might not get any result in case none of your devices is having an open port 80, or in case none of your devices is running an HTTP server. So don't worry if you didn't get any device. This is just an example to see that we can even run the ranges of IP addresses, and to test out this aggression level 3 scan since we can only do it on the websites that we own or have permission to scan. Ok, great, so look at all of the commands that we crafted with all of these options right here. And this is just a part of this WhatWeb tool. You don't need to be learning all of these commands. You can always just run the help command and read through its help menu to discover what you want to run. We won't be going through all of these options in WhatWeb tool since there is too much of them, but I encourage you to play with it a little bit and see if it has any other interesting options. Great! In the next video, we're going to see how we can harvest or gather as much emails as possible from just knowing a domain. See you there! Right now, we are going to see how we can gather emails for a certain company or a domain. Remember, people are always weak at security. If we manage to send some malicious program to someone working in a company and they run that program, we got our way in. We can also use emails in something like a brute force attack. We can use them in the username field. There are many ways this could be useful, but for now, let us just see how we can get them.
Since emails are public information, we can test this on any domain we want. To get emails, we're going to check out two different options. A tool called the Harvester, that's installed in Cal Linux, and a website called Hunter.io. Let's start with Harvester first, so open up your terminal. And to just run the help menu from the Harvester, we can type the tool name. So just type the Harvester with capital H and press enter. And this will output us with a smaller help menu, just like the WattWeb tool did. Once we specified its name, we get its banner and some of the options that we can run. It tells us since we tried to run it with just the name of the program that there is an error, the following arguments are required. So we need to specify the domain. But before we specify the domain, let us just run the bigger help menu so we can see all of our available options. Okay, great, here it is. So, we get the domain option, so we need to specify either a company name or domain name to search. This is the limit, limit of search results, which is default equal to 500. And all these other options are not really of interest to us besides this last source option. And this last source option we specify with dash P and we specify where we want to search for emails. Now we can either specify one of these, we can for example specify we want to search for Twitter, LinkedIn, Bing, Google, or we can simply just specify all and it will go through all of these in search for usernames, hosts and emails. So let's try it out. If I clear the screen, type the harvester and first thing we need to specify is dash D for the domain. And for this test, I will go with this domain right here, which is another university domain. You can go either with this one, or you can pick any website that you want and use it instead. So if I specify the harvester, dash D, then the domain name, the next option that I want to specify is dash B. And remember, dash B option is the source, so where we want to search for the emails, host names and usernames. And let us for the first try specify all. And the last option is dash L, which is the limit that is set by default to be 500, so we can either specify more than that or less than that, or we can simply just not specify dash L at all, and it will just by default scan 500 results. So if we leave it just like this, and I press here enter, the running of this command will take some time. It will search for different results, it will search for host names, it will search for usernames, and it will also search for emails. As we can see down here it says searching 300 results and this will go up to 500 since we are using the default dash L option which is 500 results. And it seems that we already got some users found. Here are some of the names as well as what do they do. So this is already some result for us. Let's just wait for all of this to finish and then we will go through all of the results that we managed to gather. Okay, so it has finished, let us check out what we got as an output. So it searched through a bunch of different platforms as we can see, LinkedIn, VirusTotal, Yahoo, Twitter, but it didn't manage to find any results for these platforms. The only thing we got is these users right here. But this is not what we looked for. We wanted to find some email addresses or perhaps some usernames. There is one thing with this Harvester tool. From my personal experience, this tool doesn't always work. There are days when it gives amazing result, but there are days when it doesn't find any emails or any hosts, just like it did in this case. As it says, fail to detect a valid IP address from this domain name. We also didn't get any emails. And I'm talking about scanning this same domain just on two different days. That's why it is always good to, do, in case you don't get any results for this tool right now, to scan it multiple times. So if I scan it once again, and instead of dash B all, I will select dash B and scan only from Google, to see if I get any different results. And if we still don't manage to get any results, just try the same command either later or tomorrow. And I guarantee you, it will usually give you a different result. As we can see, we didn't manage to find anything with this tool. That's why we got a second option. 
And that second option is a website hunter.io. So let's go and visit that website, open up your Firefox. And in the search bar up here, type hunter.io. It will automatically lead you to this website and we can see right here we got this search bar where we specify a company domain and we click on find email addresses. But on this website you must first create an account. And you either have a free account or a paid account. Technically you can even search without creating an account but it will only show you first 5 results and they will be half blurred. Let me show you. If I go here and type the same domain name that we used for Harvester. And let me just enlarge this a little bit so you can see in greater detail. And I click on find email addresses. It will show me first 5 results and they will all be blurred. Now you can technically try to figure out what these email addresses are, but they will be blurred nonetheless. And down here it also tells you how much results it managed to gather. It managed to gather 315 more results besides these 5 emails and those results will be available if you get a paid account. With free account however, let me show you how free account looks like. If I go in sign in and I sign in to my account, or you just go and create an account right here and sign in into your free account. Once you create an account, you should be able to have about 50 searches per month with a free account. As it says right here, so we got 0 out of 50 and these monthly requests reset in about one month. And as I mentioned, even with free account you also don't get all the results outputted but at least the emails that it gives you are not blurred. Let's test it out. If I type the domain name that we used this entire video and click on search, right now I managed to get some of the results right here. So I get up to 10 results with its email addresses and with their names. So we got the name and we also got the email addresses. We get right here which pattern it used to find email addresses and all of these email addresses are also split into different sections. So if I click on IT engineering, I will even get what type of work does this person do? Project advisor, IT engineering, production engineering, technical editor, as well as their email addresses. We also get from which sources we managed to get these emails. And if I go to all right here and I remove this IT engineering, down here we will also get that there are 310 more results for this domain name. So it is completely up to you whether you think you should get paid version for this. Just keep in mind that with the paid version you get much more results than with the free version. The bad side about the paid version is that it isn't cheap at all. If I go to my account up here and I click on subscription, I can see down here which plan choices I have available to purchase. And you can see 1000 requests per month will be around 50 euros per month. So this is completely up to you, but nonetheless what we did learn in this video is different ways to gather emails about a certain domain. And I encourage you to also later try out this harvester tool once again because it does know to give really good results once it works. And one more thing is that at the end of this section I will give you a tool that is coded in Python 3 that will be able to gather even more emails from a specified domain. So it will be even better than these two options that I showed you right here and it will be our own tool. I will give you its code and also show you how to run it and how it works. Ok good, in the next video we're going to see how we can install some additional tools that we might need for information gathering. See you there. Ok so for now we took a look at couple of tools used for information gathering but what happens if some of the tools stop working? or if they get outdated. What are we going to do? We cannot depend on certain tools. If a tool breaks, we must find our way around to do the task either using other tool or by creating that tool ourselves. Well, luckily, there are a lot of tools available for us to download online. 
and we cannot cover all of them but what is important to cover is how we can download them. So in this video we are going to be searching for an information gathering tool that we can download online and then run in Kali Linux. And the best place where we can find those to download is GitHub. Most of you, if you are either a developer or a programmer, are already familiar with GitHub and for those of you who don't know what GitHub is, GitHub is the world's largest community of developers that build and share their software. So let's see how we can download some additional tools from there. First of all, open up your Firefox and when we download tools, we either know exactly which tools we want to download, so we search them by their name, or we have no idea what tools even exist. And this is the case where we don't even know what we want. We only know that we are looking for a tool used for information gathering. So let's just type that. In search bar, type information gathering tools github. Up here, information gathering tools github. Press enter. Ok, so let's just click and go with the first link. Information gathering tools. Make sure that it is from the GitHub page. And down here it will output us with a bunch of different tools that are used for information gathering. As we can see in the description, scan all possible TLDs for a given domain name, information gathering, website reconnaissance. This is a program to detect probability of admin page. And uh, we got a bunch of different tools. If we go to some other links, we will also see some other tools available. So from the second link we get the Sherlock, the Photon, F Society, and Testing Bible. If we go all the way down, here is the Harvester. Remember this tool we used in the previous video. And by the way, if you didn't test out once again whether you managed to get some of the results with it, try it out right now. And down here we will get Discover, which is also a known tool, Raccoon, Striker, Red Hawk, Sand map and a bunch of others as well and let's just go with any one of them. Let's just go with this one. Let us read the description, it says all in one tool for information gathering, vulnerability scanning and crawling. A must tool have for all penetration testers. Ok, so it seems interesting, let us click on it. Click on Red Hawk and here is the page of the tool. These are all of the files that the tool has, we can see them right here. Down here we got read me. This is what we can perform with Red Hawk, so we can read what are our available options with it. And down here released versions, change log. Down here we also get how we can install it, how to configure it, and we get usage. Now sometimes you will need to install some of the requirements that the tool needs in order to run. And you can almost always find the commands that you must run on this tool page. So as we can see right here, we got the usage and installation, so all we need to do is follow both of them. And different tools might need different requirements, but this is something that you will get better at the more tools you install. However, to just download a tool from GitHub, you will always use the same command and for this command what we need to do is we need to copy the link to this tool. So copy up here this link, right click copy, let us lower this page and open our terminal and the command is git clone and by the way make sure that you're in the slash desktop directory before you run this, then type git clone space and then paste the link and press enter. And this is the command that we use to download a tool from GitHub. As we can see right here, it downloaded all of the files and right now on our desktop we got the folder called Red Hawk, which is our tool. And also keep in mind that sometimes once you are searching for a tool, you might need to download multiple different tools before you run into a good one. So let's test this Red Hawk tool out, let's see whether it is any good. To run it, well, we don't know how to run it, but we can go to the Red Hawk directory and see what files we got right here. So we got some PHP configuration files, functions, PHP, these are all of the files that we really are not interested in at the moment. If there was for example a usage file, we would most likely want to read that. 
in case the tool is complicated, but for now we got this redhawk.php file. And out of all of these files, this is the file that seems to be the tool. So how can we run this? Well, first we notice what type of file it is. It is a PHP file. So to run it, we must type PHP and then the file name. If it was for example a Python file, we would type Python and then the file name. So depending on which file type it is, we run it like this, so php redhawk.php and press enter. It will load this with its banner and it tells us right here that some of the modules are missing and it tells us that we can try fix command or we can simply just install it ourselves using terminal. So let's see whether this tool will install it for us. If I type fix, checking if curl module is installed, curl module not installed, and installing curl operation requires sudo permission, so you might be asked for password. This asks us for sudo password, and let's input it. And it seems to be downloading the curl module for us automatically, and we don't need to run other commands. It is also installing the second thing that I'm missing, so let's just wait for this to finish. And it tells us right here, job finished successfully. Please restart Red Hawk. So let's clear the screen and run once again PHP Red Hawk. And right now we don't get any error messages right here. It only asks us which website we want to scan. So let's just go with Google, why not? Let's see what are the available options that we have. Enter 1 for HTTP or Enter 2 for HTTPS and since Google is HTTPS of course, we will select 2. And here are all of the available options that we can use with our Red Hawk. Basic Recon, Site Title, IP Address, Cloud Threat Detection. So let's see just the Basic Recon of Google. If I type number 0, it should perform the Basic Recon. And here are some of the basic output for Google. So we got site title to be Google, IP address, web server, Cloudflare, and it seems to be stuck at Cloudflare. So let's just control C it. It could be just a bug. And let's run it once again. Type google.com, type 24 HTTPS, and let's go once again with zero just to see whether it will perform it correctly right now. And never mind, it seems to be stuck at Cloudflare once again. So let's just go with other options and test them out. Now this is what I'm talking about, maybe if you don't like this tool, maybe you want to consider going and finding some other one, but for now we only tested one of the options, so let's go with other ones as well and see what else can we get. The who is lookup, let's go with that one. And we get the who is response for our Google. Good, so this option seems to work. It tells us scanning complete, press enter to continue, so let's continue and let's go with geo IP lookup. This should tell us the coordinates of the Google and it does tell us the country, the IP address, the latitude and longitude, but city and state seems to be unavailable. Let's go with another option. We got grab banners, DNS lookup, subnet calculator, and map port scan and this option right here is something that we are not going to run right now. Since this is something that we cover in the scanning section, the subdomain scanner is also something that we are not going to be doing right now. These options as well, so these are just some of the advanced options that we are going to cover later on, so we won't be running them at the moment. We can go with, for example, DNS lookup to check out which DNS service it has, and here is the output. So this tool seems to be pretty good. It does give us some of the information for Google. Now, of course, there are other options that we didn't run and that I would advise you not to run since some of them can be considered advanced scanning methods. But nonetheless, we will be covering them in the next section. So, for now on, what we did is we managed to find the random tool on GitHub, install it and get it to work. We also tested it out and it did give us some of the information. Now, what I want you to do for the next video is try to download the same way a tool called Sherlock. It is also a tool from GitHub, we saw it up here. If I go one step back to this page, the first tool that we saw was, I believe, called Sherlock. Try to download this tool. It is a tool that is used to discover different accounts on different platforms based on the usernames that you specify. 
try it out and we will see how to download it and run it in the next video. Have you managed to download the Sherlock tool? If you did, congrats! If not, let's see how we can get it and what we can do with it. So if you haven't already, open up your Firefox and type Sherlock GitHub. The first link should be at the original link of the tool that should lead you to this GitHub page. Once you're on the Sherlock page, you should see all of the files that belong to this tool. Down here, we will see the installation, so how we can install the tool. And right here, we will also see the usage. But before we check out the usage of the tool, let us go and download Sherlock first. So, we already know how we can do that. Just copy the link to this tool. Open up your terminal. And type git clone. And then paste the link of the tool. Press enter. And this should automatically download the tool for us. We can see this tool is a lot larger than the Red Hawk since it took a little bit more time to download. And once it finishes downloading, we should type ls and we will see the Sherlock folder inside of our desktop directory. Let us navigate to that folder. And if I type ls in it, we should see all of these files that we saw on this page right here. Good. Let us close this. We are not going to be checking anything on this page anymore. And outside of all of these files, we want to go to this Sherlock folder. So if I go cd sherlock and type ls right here, here is the tool. It is a python tool and we know that this is the tool since it is named sherlock.py. All these other python files are simply just the additional files for this tool that is probably getting imported inside of this. So to run this we can type the command python3 and then sherlock. Hmm, no module named to request. So this could either mean one of two things. This tool is supposed to be ran with Python 2 or this module does not exist for Python 3. And if you get an error that some module doesn't exist, what you want to do is you want to type pip3 install and then the name of the module. So I can just copy this, copy selection and paste it right here. Let's see whether we can download this module. And it seems that the requirement has already been satisfied, so it could be that we're missing this module for Python 2. Let's try first to run it once again, after running this command. So this command actually did something. As it says, it performed building of wheels for collected packages, and it managed to resolve our problem. So now we can run the tool. It does give us an error right here, but this is just a syntax error that tells us that some arguments are required, such as usernames. So let me just clear the screen and type python3 sherlock.py once again. And here are all of the available options that we can use with Sherlock. But the basic usage of this tool is specifying python3 sherlock.py and then after it comes a username. What this tool will do with that username is it is going to search through a bunch of different platforms for the same username. So if you for example had a username that you discovered for some domain or for some company and you wanted to discover whether that person has some other accounts with the same username, you can throw it in this tool and it will find you all the other accounts that have that same username. What are we going to use here? Do you remember our harvester tool? It didn't work once we tried it out but what I did few minutes ago is I ran the command on the same domain that didn't work previously once we tried it before. I also put the source to be Twitter so it managed to find 10 users that have Twitter and these users are discovered from this domain. If I go and copy any one of them and let's go with keyframes and throw it in this tool I should be able to discover other accounts that have this same username. So here we already got this one. And by the way, this is not really a unique username, so it might be that this account, for example, doesn't belong to the same person. But if you were to find a unique username, such as for example maybe this one, or this one, or even this one, and throw it inside of this tool, and you manage to discover some other accounts, 
those accounts will probably belong to that person. But if the username was something like media, and we put media inside of the Sherlock tool, well then most likely all of those accounts will not belong to the same person. Okay, so here is our output and it managed to discover a bunch of other accounts that also have the same username. So let's try with another username. If I go all the way down and control C this, then clear the screen. And let's pick for example this username, copy it, and I throw it inside of this tool once again. Let us see whether we manage to find another platform that has this same account. So it seems that most of them are giving us not found. Let's wait for final results. And here they are. So we already get the output for Wikipedia. We got our username that we discovered from the Twitter profile. If I go all the way up, let's see whether we manage to find something else. And it seems that all of the others have not found. And here is also a Catch Me profile with the same username. So that is another result that we managed to gather. Okay, great. So that would basically be it for this tool. Now, another thing that this tool does is it also saves our results in a file. So if I go and control C this, clear the screen and type LS. Oh, never mind. It seems that it didn't save it. Maybe if we specified an option for it to save, let us run the help menu. No such far or directory. Yeah, that's because we are in a wrong folder. So let me go to the Sherlock folder and run the python 3 sherlockpy dash dash help and yeah we actually probably had to run this output command and after the output we specify the file name and the output of the result will be saved to this file so it doesn't save it by default and you can also check out other options as well but the purpose of this in previous video was to figure out how we can download additional tools you might never use this tool again, or you might use it every time. It depends on which type of penetration tests you perform and what kind of strategy you plan for your attacks. But it is always good to have a bunch of different tools and options that you can use. Now that we know how we can download tools from GitHub, every time a certain tool breaks or you don't get the desired result with some tool, you can go to GitHub and try to find a similar tool that will give you better results. Okay, good. So, in the next video, I will give you a bonus tool that I created in Python 3 that will be able to gather much more emails than the already built-in tools in Cal Linux. Welcome back! And in this bonus video, we're going to be covering the tool that I created in Python 3 that is used to gather emails. Now, even though later in the course we will be coding some of our own Python tools, this is one that we will not code, so we will just see how it works. I will explain how it works, of course and we are going to see how many emails it can gather. So, this is the tool right here, called Email Scraper, and you will have this to download in the resources of this lecture. But let me show you how you can transfer it on the Cal Linux desktop. If you go up here on the devices, and you go on drag and drop, and click on bidirectional, then anything that you have on your desktop, since I had the program right here, if you go and drag it to your Cal Linux machine, it will get moved onto your Cal Linux desktop. As you can see right here, this folder already contains this file, since I already have it on my desktop, so I will just skip this. But you, after setting this to be directional, can transfer any file from your host desktop to your Cal Linux desktop. Okay, good. Now that we know how we can transfer it, let us see what this tool is and how we can run it. So just to check out the code of this tool real quick, let us double click on it and let me enlarge all of this. And what this tool essentially does is it asks us for the URL and we provide it with the URL of a certain domain name. Then what this tool does is it tries to extract all of the emails that are in the HTML page of the URL that you specified. But what it also does is it tries to crawl within other URLs that are found inside of that page. For example, this count variable right here, that is equal to 100, means that we will be searching for emails in 100 different links. So you specify the main URL, then it goes through that URL, it extracts all of the emails, 
but it also extracts all of the other URLs that are leading to different pages. Then it goes to those different pages and performs the same thing. It tries to find the emails and it also finds more URLs. And it does that until it reaches 100 URLs. This is a number that you can change if you want to, so you can set this to be lower or higher depending on how much results you want to find. Down here we can see that it is finding those emails using regex. So this is the pattern that we are searching for. And don't worry if you don't understand any of this. Regex is just a way for us to find certain patterns in a lot of text. So for example, this is a pattern that will allow us to find emails in the HTML code of the page. And then we, at the end of this, print all of the emails that we found. So that is the basic principle behind this tool. Let us see how it runs and whether we managed to find more emails than we did with Hunter.io and the Harvester. So let's close this, go to our terminal, find where you have this file downloaded and I have it on my desktop. And to just run it, we can type Python 3 and then the name of the file. It will tell us enter target URL to scan and here I'm going to specify the full URL to the same domain name that we used for the harvester and hunter.io just so we can compare how many results we get with this tool and how many results we got with hunter.io and the harvester. So if I type the domain name and press here enter this will go and process 100 links. And depending on whether you change the number, it might be higher or lower. And at the end of processing these links, it will print out all of the emails that it managed to find. So if you remember, with Hunter.io, the website that we used, with the free account we managed to gather 10 different emails. With the Harvester, first time we didn't manage to get any email, but after running it a couple of times, we might be able to get around 10 to 15 different emails with the Harvester. But let's see how many this tool will find. So let's just wait for this to finish and I will get back to you as soon as it's done. Okay, so the tool has finished scanning and here are all of the emails that we managed to find. You can see there is at least 100 or 150 of them and they all belong to the same domain. Now, we might occasionally find some email that doesn't belong to this domain and we saw one down here, I believe. We just find it, this one. It doesn't have the domain name inside of the email, but all of the others do. And we got at least 5 to 10 times more results than we managed to get with the Harvester, which is Cal Linux tool, or with the free account of Hunter.io. And here are all the links that it processed, so it clicked on all of these links and it tried to extract as much emails as it could from these links. Cool, right? So now you have a tool that will be able to capture a lot of emails based on the specified domain. Just make sure that once you run the tool, you specify HTTP or HTTPS before the domain name. Okay, so this tool is now yours. Feel free to use it as much as you want. And later on in the course, we will also be coding our own Python tools. There will not be some too advanced tools, but we will be covering basics of creating our own hacking tools, which is something that every hacker should at some point of their journey learn. Great, so now that we finished with the information gathering section, we are ready to start off with scanning section. And you might be wondering how are you going to be able to follow the scanning section and all the other sections since you don't really have permission to scan any website. Don't worry, there are a lot of free vulnerable machines and websites that we can download and practice on them and we're going to be seeing how we can find them and install them inside of our virtual box. So we will have our own vulnerable lab where we can practice our hacking. So thank you for watching this section and I will see you in the next one. Welcome back. Here we are ready to start our scanning phase. We have covered the information gathering which was first phase of penetration testing and now we will proceed with the second stage by scanning our target and trying to get even more information about it. Now, the difference between information gathering and scanning is that scanning is performed on a much deeper level. 
and also, while in the first phase, we gathered all kinds of information, such as emails, phone numbers and a bunch of other things, in the scanning, we are mainly focused on technology side. So we want to find out as much as we can about our target's technical aspect. We are going to talk about in just a second as to what exactly are we looking for in this stage and what are all the goals of this stage. But first, you could be wondering what are we going to scan, since remember that scanning is something that we are not allowed to do on any target that we want. Don't worry, for this stage and any future stage from now on, we are going to be using vulnerable virtual machines. There are lots of paid vulnerable virtual machines that you can buy and test on, but for this course I will be showing the free ones. So all of us can download them, install them and then try to hack them. All of these virtual machines are going to be running some outdated vulnerable software that we will be able to exploit in the third stage and they will also require very little hardware power so all of us will be able to run them while also running Kali Linux. And keep in mind that penetration testing process will look exactly like it would look in real world, if you were to test some website or some network. The only difference is that right now we know that these machines are vulnerable since I just told you, and in real world you wouldn't essentially know that before testing them. However, just knowing they are vulnerable doesn't really help us as we need to figure out in what way are they vulnerable and how can we take advantage of that. Scanning will help us with this. We will be using our Kali Linux machine to scan these machines. And by scanning these machines what they really mean is we are going to directly exchange packets with our target and once that target sends packets back to us, hopefully it will discover something about the target machine that we will find useful. And what we will be sending to the target are TCP and UDP packets. TCP and UDP are just protocols that are used for sending bits of data, also known as packets. And we will discuss them in a little more detail in the next video. For now, just think of them as different communication protocols that will allow us to get information from our target. I keep talking about information and scanning and all of that without actually explaining what do I mean by scanning and getting information. What are the goals of this? What are we looking for exactly? Well, we're looking for open ports. And I don't mean USB ports or some physical ports, I mean we're looking for virtual open ports that every machine has, and it uses them to host their software and communicate with other machines over internet. For example, you watching this over internet on a website means that the machine that's hosting this website has port 80 open. Why port 80? Well, port 80 is used to host a web server. It is used for HTTP and it's also known as HTTP port. So every time you visit a website, you are essentially making a connection to that machine hosting that website on port 80 or on port 443 since port 80 is used for HTTP and port 443 